Hello. Hello and welcome to this um, webinar on, um, on um, digital issues in wound care. My name is Ian Radley. I'm the director of the National Wound Care Strategy Programme and I've been asked to chair this session. And we are going to hear talks from Anne Jacqueline, who works with me leading our digital data and information work in the National Programme. Um, Louise Parker, who is the Project and Improvement Lead in York Community Services and who is um, um, in helping implement the use of one of the wound management digital systems. And Ariel Goodman from Livewell, who is a district nursing manager and also involved in quality and development, also implementing one of what we refer to the programme as wound management digital systems. It's lovely to have people on board today with this webinar. Can I first, yeah, I'm sure most of you have already done this, but could you just put yourselves into mute? Because um, there are always people who come wandering into the room. In my case, it can be a small dog or a grandchild, but I'm hoping I won't get either during this. And you will hopefully on the top, you will see the chat function. We will be taking questions at the end, but if you would like to put your questions or comments into the chat, we would absolutely welcome that because then we it will help me at the end, make sure I try and address or get the speakers to address as many of those as possible. Um, as we, as I said a few minutes ago, um, we at the National Programme, the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, absolutely embracing the whole concept of digital data and information. Um, one of the problems I think in wound care has been that it's been invisible because we've lacked that data and we've lacked that information. I'm not going to say any more about the National Strategy because Anne's coming on to do that. But we, from a very early stage, we have promoted what we call um, Wound Management Digital System, WMDS, we tend to refer them to. Um, and we're very grateful to um, Healthy IO who are sponsoring um, this webinar um, to help us get that message out there about these, um, these very useful products that can make such a difference to clinical practice, both in terms of the day-to-day -day management of a patient, but also in terms of how you organize your services and how you monitor your quality. Um, simply in the interest of impartiality, as a national programme sponsored by NHS England, obviously we have to be impartial and we have to note there are other brands available apart from Healthy IO. And um, my mentioning this is um, that we are, we very much endorse the principle that we don't go down the route of endorsing a particular product, but that doesn't mean to say we're not very grateful. They've given us this, help us have this space today. So I think on that note, I will pass over to Anne Jacqueline as our first speaker to take us through what's happening from a national perspective. Anne, do you want to open your camera? Thank you. Ah, even better. There we go. Anne, your, your camera's off as well. I'm, I'm sure people would love to see you. If uh, you're feeling... My camera's on at this end. And oh, I is it? Well, that's I... interesting. We'll live without you. <laughs> so... I, look, I look better when you can't okay. see me. But, um, no problem. Uh, as long as you can hear me, that's important. We so I'd like you. to also um, thank everybody for giving us this opportunity um, to say a little bit about the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, but to focus on to our, our approach to data and information. And in this regard, I am simply a warm-up act for, um, for Lou and Ariel, which I'm sure you'd be much more interested in hearing from. Nevertheless, you've got to sit through and hear how it all fits together. But hopefully the context setting will be um, useful. Next slide, please, Adam. And so apologies to Lou, who I know is not clinical for the photograph on the right and anybody else who is not. But we um, uh, that's a picture of a, a lower limb wound. So Una and I come from the National Lower Limb Wound Programme and our scope is to develop a strategy that focuses on improving the care of lower limb ulcers, pressure ulcers and surgical wounds. And, and our job is to work with clinicians, managers and finance people to explain, establish what the clinical case is and what is the economic and business case for change. So to do that, we have to identify what good looks like, uh, which we do in the form of our clinical recommendations. Then we have to work out from what good looks like, what do you need to change and improve to deliver the recommendations, and then um, how work about how you can describe the steps needed to deliver those, which I'll come back to later when I talk about our implementation steps. So next slide, please. 
And so um, this is a rather old formatted slide, but it's a way of trying to pull together what is our approach. So we, we are an NHS England sponsored program. Um, and we have on the left our formal governance of our work streams. And so I've already said that what we focus on is lower limb, pressure ulcers and surgical wounds. What we have, though, is to support our work programme is that we have a number of enabler. If there are clinical work streams that they did drive what good looks like from a clinical perspective and a clinically led, they are supported by a number of um, underpinning enabling work streams. So a big part of our program, and I'll come back to in a model a moment about the, the model of our program where you'll see where education and workforce sits in. Um, but I lead the data now digital data and information work stream and I'll be, be spending most of the time talking about that. We also have an extensive um, stakeholder network where we have a stakeholder council who help us think about where we reach out for consultations, advice from our three stakeholder forums. So we have a supplier forum, and that's so that we can stay engaged with, hear from, and update colleagues who work in either wound care dressing product suppliers or indeed technology, including wound management digital system suppliers, so they stay aligned with the programme. We're interested in people supplying to the NHS, understanding what the NHS wants and what good looks like. We also, very importantly, need to understand the patient and almost as importantly, equal importance, oh, I don't want to prioritise importance, also important are carers. And so we have a patient and a carer forum and we have a health and, and care professional forum. If you haven't visited the NWCSP website and registered yourself as a stakeholder and you thought might, might be interested in our programme, I suggest you do that. My final slide does have the email address um, for the programme. So that gives you a, a sense of where we sit as a, a programme with data and information being a, a very important enabler work stream. Next slide, please, Adam. The other thing that the sort of the framework that we work on, which I think goes back a little bit to those work streams, is that um, we are a transformation programme um, and we we are following the framework of people, processes and technology. So we know that if you want to improve wound care, um, uh, you need to be thinking about how are you, who are your people? Who are the people that you have delivering care or contact in contact with um, people who deliver care who will need to understand some basics of wound care, but also need to particularly understand what are the available services locally in terms of the dedicated lower limb services that we're recommending, but where to go to to find the current advice on what looks good for wound care. So there's something about upskilling your workforce. We know many of our patients with wounds sit in the community. They will sit in community care, primary care, social care, and having uh, health and social care providers aware of basics of wound care, having their educational levels up and knowing about referrals is very important. We also need to support the people who are providing um, care services um, to know what the current guidance and recommendation are. So we've got a whole suite of educational materials that sit on health education uh, England website. They're free to use for people providing NHS care and they're frankly brilliant. We are working with a number of uh, implementation sites where we go through what is what are the process changes that you need to do in order to think about referrals into services, referrals out of services, running services, and what good looks like from a process perspective. And underpinning all of this, and most importantly, is the technology. Um, if you want to, we, everyone that's done any improvement work um, with the IHA models um, knows that if you want to run an improvement product, the first thing you do is you identify the improvement, you describe it, and then you start to measure 
what it is that you want to improve and then you monitor the improvement um, to make sure that you the things you're doing actually show an improvement. We know that um, there's a great deal of expertise about wound care within the NHS and within people who provide service to NHS patients. What's missing um, quite often is, and particularly in the community sector, is the data to describe what is the current burden of, of wound care, but to also show improvements and make sure that people are implementing our best practice guidelines. So in that technology, there's something about digital tools, but a lot about turning data into information and then using information for improvement in various ways. So if I can go to the next slide. So we're a people, processes and technology. And so at a very high level, what do we mean as a national wound care programme by data and information? Well, what we mean by data and information is what we're interested in is our patient data. So if we're going to work with our patients, we do need to understand something about our patients, not only with regard to their, their demographics, but where are they coming from? Where are we referring them to? What are their diagnoses? What are the activity volumes and how we're best treating people? And most importantly, what are the outcomes we're getting? And our programme for lower limb is, is highly focused on uh, lower limb healing rates and, in, and improving. Um, as part of that, we want to make sure that as part of our people and our processes that we've got the people who are delivering wound care are adequately um, trained and have the right skills to provide modern wound care, but also they're working in services which are adequately um, specified and supported. So for workforce and productivity, we're interested in the staff involved, thinking about skill mix and thinking about the type of activities. We are interested in wound care products, but it's probably the lowest focus, uh, certainly the lowest focus of my time. We know that what good looks like from a lower limb perspective is getting the right person early to the right team to do the right assessment to then either refer for surgical interventions plus or minus for lower limb, getting people into early and appropriate compression. Uh, wound care products, important, but not a major priority for our program at the moment. So everything else that I talk about from here, I'm really focusing on patient and workforce data. So if I think about data, I also then need to think about information. And we use information for two major purposes in the NHS. Well, actually, we don't. We historically have thought about data and information all being about business processes. So we know that we have data information to support commissioning and contract management, to have service management for business case development and performance management. We've paid much less attention, in my experience, into the NHS about the UTA data for clinical purposes. And so what, and particularly in the community, what support do staff providing clinicians and carers and healers and patients, actually, what data do they have available or information to support at point of care, um, continuity of care, decision support, knowing what good looks like, how much time do we all, all spend auditing and re-auditing and um, trying to do improvement programmes. And so what a lot of our work is focuses on, on thinking about data and information from a clinician perspective that will help a clinician in treating a patient and then using that to drive business processes. So we are starting um, in a different way to a lot of the way that data has been looked at from a NHS historical perspective. So what we're really interested in is clinical utility and supporting patients, carers and health and care staff. So if I can have the next slide, please. And this one just builds on the last one. If we think about clinical data, we are talking about what we need at local and provider level. And you need, the arrow is about increasing granularity in order to support clinicians, review clinicians, enable MDTs, 
do all the things that are identified on the right, you need a lot of data in a fairly granular form that enables you to look after a paper, patient. At a system level, we know that wound care is a system get a game. You will have patients who flow between primary community and secondary care and indeed into social care. So how are we making sure that the right information about a patient for either a clinical or a process perspective can be reviewed at system level? And then what are we looking at nationally, regionally, and, and how do we make sure that the data that's used for business purposes, service commissioning, service review, actually reflects the current clinical processes? So if I can go to the next slide, please. And through this sort of approach, we've ended up with our, our data principles. And that is that we should be looking at data for its clinical purposes. And I know when we come to some of the further presentations, we'll also be talking about images. And for the purposes of the National Wound Care Programme, we think about data, an image as a type of data. It just happens to be a, a digital image, that, that, but it, it counts in our views about data and information. And you want to be able to make sure that you've got information, data and images in a way that can help the clinician, but also can mean that the clinician is incentivized because they're getting some use about it to improve data collection and data quality. And then anything that you need for business purposes, you can derive from what you're collecting for clinical purposes. Next slide, please. So that takes us through, um, pretty dull slide though, but if you want to think about data flow, which I keep mentioning because I want to be able to, from one patient, be able to get a senior review with another patient, be able to get a vascular review. I want to be able to review a patient across the pathway, and I want to be able to look at your services nationally. Then you've got the notion of what is the clinical documentation that a clinician fills out, um, what sort of digital system is that entered into, and who enters it. Once it's in a system, how is it stored and is it stored as data or is it stored as a PDF in a notes file, which is then great for an individual patient review, but not very good if you want to consolidate data and, and look at groups of patients. You've then got to think about whether your data, is it standardized, is it coded, can it be extracted? And you will have different places in organization different people whose role it is to think about how to help clinicians work through what they do at the front, enabling the other things as a passive process. We then need to be thinking about how we upload data into national data sets and then the reporting that comes out. So there are a lot of people involved in the process, but arguably the most important are how we support clinicians at the front end with their clinical documentation and met how many clinicians you meet that spend a lot of time typing into um, a system on an EMIS or Rio, but they never see anything back and they never get any clinical utility for it. That's what we're trying to change as part of the program. So if I go to the next slide, please, this is the link for wound management digital systems. So we recognize that we think if you want to have an image, you're talking about having a tool with a camera. If you've got a tool with a camera, you need to think about what else would be useful to be captured at the point of taking a picture. So you want to be able to record the outcomes of an assessment. You want to be able to record something about the treatment going on. And so we, as a national program, developed this concept of a wound management digital system. And on our website, we have a functional overview, which basically lists the features that we believe help you as a clinician, as an NHS manager, as a developer of WMDSs, know what the NHS is looking for. And so that we've got a shared understanding of what we mean by WMDS. We in the last year have commissioned the professional record standards body to think about how do we standardize the way information this is boring if you're clinical but it's important we've got to standardize information and be able to get data flows and then more interestingly even if you've got a system and we know that most clinicians are interested in images it's not quite that simple and we've done some support information for how you take a good image 
that we've also shared with our system developers who are working all of the time to improve the utility of image capture so that you don't get confused that dark light is the same as, as necrosis and various things. So there's some resources there for people to use. So if I can go to the next slide, um, please. Then I can then talk about, I've told you a little bit about the shape of the program where people, processes and technology, a little bit about how we view data and information and where WMDS fit in. We don't just sit in an ivory tower, or as you can see from Una and I, in our, in our home offices or dining rooms. We work with seven first tranche implementation sites. That's one local health economy in, in seven, each of the seven regions of England, to, to be implementing our lower limb recommendations, people, processes, and technology, where we're learning about how best to do all the things I've talked about and, and see how we enable to support clinicians in their day-to-day -day work um, and from that derive data and information that nobody's interested in the front end. I know, Yuna, I'm nearly finished. Thank you. Um, we've just started to work with the Academic Health Science Networks who are develop who have just recruited five test and evaluation sites. And we're doing some work with the NHS England Transformation Directorate. And that's my last slide. And it's through working with those currently set, set 12 um, NHS systems is we're getting live feedback from people trying to work on the, the ground that informs the thinking of everything I've shared with you. And my last slide just, I think, has a website. Um, and so our apologies for marginally overrunning. Um, I nearly always do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. That's why I flashed my mind up. I know we we both of us could talk behind Doug off a donkey, but I hope it's useful. As we say, there'll be questions at the end. If anything has occurred you want to ask about, please put it in the chat and we will pick it up um, at the end. But Louise, can I please pass on to you now to take us forward into the work you're doing in New York? Thank you very much. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, my signal's not brilliant, so I'm going to turn my camera off as well, if that's um, <laughs> if that's OK. Of course. Um, so, um, hopefully the, the first slide is, um, that you can see on screen, I'm just having a little bit of problem seeing it at, at my end. So I'm hoping that my, um, signal is going to recover, but hopefully you can hear me. So I've just been asked to talk about, um, our journey, um, in York around implementing, um, a digital, um, wound imagery tool that, um, we were fortunate enough to be able to get some funding to test and try out. Um, so that's, that. That's uh, that's the journey that I'm going to um, take you on. Um, Adam, could you go to next slide, please? You're okay there, Lou. Your next slide's up. Lou, have we forgot? Have we lost you? Um, so, um, <laughs> so. Uh, our starting point was um, we'd had um, a, a long-standing aim in our community services to um, use clinical imagery to help our community um, nurses su support the care that they were delivering to um, our patients. And we tried for a long time um, to get a, a consistent use of cl clinical imagery, which for, for us was just taking photographs from um from a mobile phone, um, but we didn't really have very very good success. And when uh, we started to um, really investigate about what were some of those barriers, what we found was that um, for us taking the image was really time consuming. There was a lot of variation in the image, so people didn't really see the point. Um, we didn't have clear leadership in each one of our teams, and we we call those teams microsystems. So I'll, I'll come on and explain what what that is. Um, and really, we we had very little access. Um, to, to training or support for our frontline staff. So we, we wanted to um, really, uh, I think, do, do something different around how we were supporting our staff to, um, to start to make best use of, of clinical imagery. Um, Adam, could you go to the next slide, please? So these were the things that we identified that we wanted to do. We really wanted to be able to have the, the right product. Uh, and like I said, we were fortunate enough to be able to apply and be successful for some funding from the Unified Tech Fund under a fund called um, PODAC, which enabled us to purchase a, a wound care image 
laboratory system called Healthy IO that was the one that we, we wanted to test. But really importantly, we had a really good um, clinical lead who was um, who volunteered to um, take on this this project and we also had some really willing volunteers who said if we could get hold of the wound care application um, uh, uh, product and if we could get the right sort of um, kit to be able to take that wound care um, imagery from which for us was a really high quality mobile phone that those volunteers would would give it a go um, so that that's where we started. Um, Adam, can you go to the next slide, please? Which seems really obvious, but I, I've been involved in some projects from a from a um, improvement perspective, where I, actually it's been quite a top down. Um, requirements and what we wanted to be able to do was to be able to turn this on its head and do something from the bottom up, i.e. find those clinicians who would be willing to give this um, imagery work ago and so that we could learn and see what we could um, see what we could achieve by doing it so we identified what we called our clinical microsystem we, which was the team that we wanted to test this with first that peer-to-peer -peer influence who were those really really important clinical colleagues who would actually get, give this new way of working a go and who would honestly feed back to us about whether or not this was something that made a difference and um, we used Roger's curve of adoption which I've I've got a slide later on and, and show you why that theory became really increasingly important for us, particularly around those people who would be those early innovators uh, and early majority to give something a go. We, we employed the idea of social movement theory, which is about not just identifying those people in leadership role, but very, very crucially, um, the followers, the, the people who would be using this type of um, product on, on the ground to um, help and support the care of their patients. And then we use some of the stuff from the IHI. So we use the idea of PDSA cycles. We use the idea of testing. We use the idea of having a fairly strong vision, but actually wanting to give that a go in practice. And what we found through the use of these PDSA cycles, again, which I'll, I'll come on and explain, was it really gave um, permission to people to be quite innovative and creative and not to be too constrained in a highly planned SOP when actually we were, we were really starting off through a process of, of discovery. Um, we wanted to make sure that we gave lots of support. So we, we have been fortunate in that we've been able to uh, wrap my time as a project and improvement um, lead, as well as a, a clinical person, a, a TVN nurse that we were able to second out of um, her role for a couple of days a week to be able to walk hand in hand with our clinicians on the ground who were, who were trying to test out this new way of working. And then we worked really hard to gather the stories. So what, what was, if you like, the lived experience of being able to use the, the wound imagery and what difference did that actually make to our, to our patients? So those, those, were the, those were the guiding principles, if you like, that we managed this piece of work um, uh, um, through over these uh, last six to nine months. Adam, could you go to the next slide, please? So this is our idea of a clinical microsystem. It's taken from the Sheffield um, Microsystems Coaching Academy, which is the um, nod that you can see there on the bottom of the slide, the MCA. And this is really about trying to take the idea of testing out a change right to the very front line where that care delivery um, is happening. So whilst we had really enthusiastic senior leaders from our district nursing team who really wanted to promote clinical imagery and the benefits that that might offer for our staff and our patients, what we knew is that we really needed to be able to take that idea right into those front lines teams and ask them what it felt like for them and ask our patients if this really did make a difference to their care. So that, that's, that's where we've tried to place, um, a, a, actually, I would say 90% of our effort right into that clinical microsystem or right into our, our test teams. Um, Adam, can you go to the next slide, please? And, and this is what we were looking for in one of the in a high performing clinical microsystem. So we did set ourselves up to be really successful. We wanted to work with a team who wanted to work with us. And so these are the things that we were actually looking for as part of that clinical microsystem or our first tip test team. So we, we wanted the, the staff, the people who would give it a go. We wanted that team, obviously, to be able to have patients that we could be able to test out this um, application on and, and, and create that 
discovery or learning phase. We wanted to be able to track our performance. Um, and so we wanted to be able to see that visible improvement, as Anne said, um, some of that's data and some of that's through the clinical imagery itself and the difference that that could make to the delivery of care. And we wanted to have the leadership at that level, i.e. we wanted our matron and our team leads and really importantly, our district, um, our district nurses at all levels throughout their team to actually say, yeah, we'll, we'll, give, this, um, we'll give this a go. And those were our um, conditions for success, if you like, when we then asked for um, teams to volunteer to be part of our, our teams. Louise, I think we lost you there for a minute. I think we've lost you entirely now. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping Louise will come back on in a minute to carry on. Yes, looking hopeful. Louise, sorry, we lost you for a second there. Sorry, yeah. I'm just, just really going to go to the next. Next slide. Next, next slide. So this this is Roger's curve of, in, of innovation. It, it's used an awful lot in improvement methodology. What we were really clear about is that not everybody, we even within the teams that volunteered to be part of our test teams, would really want to give um, this application a go. And what we were really keen on doing is we were keen on finding two lots of people very, very early on. Those innovators who are, like you can see on the left-hand side of the curve, who are not often not very many people within a spread of people who would be willing to try something new. And then those other people who very early would actually start to come on board and also give something a go once they'd actually seen maybe the application in process. And this is where this idea of leaders and followers really started to take hold in, in, in our team. Teams. And so we focused our efforts very much on that left hand side of the curve of people within the team. And we called those people our di digital champions. They volunteered, they weren't picked. So there were people who were willing to give it a go. And we didn't have a specific number. We just said anybody who would be willing to volunteer, please, please, um, please be part of our um, initial testing of, of this process. And then we had a very strong sense that other people in the team, either the early as they saw the benefits of, of this particular way of working. And we've also held within our um, test teams that we'll know for some people, and I think the term laggard can be slightly disrespectful, So, um, although it's there on the, on the slide because it's part of Roger's curve of adoption, it's not necessarily a term that I would say out loud, that there will be some people who this way of working with, with, this, with our particular application, it, it's just it's just not something that they're going to grasp very easily. And there's all sorts of re reasons um, for that. Um, Adam, could you go to the next slide, please? So this is this is just a video that um, I, I wondered if it might be quite nice to show you because this is quite an illustration, I hope, of the um, kind of process that we've used as we've started to um, test out and then hopefully spread uh, and get more and more people on board in our teams to use this particular application that we've got for, for digital imagery. So for, for me and for the teams that we've showed it to, it's really showing the concept of what we mean by leaders and followers are those innovators and, and, um, and, and early adopters and then, and then your later majority. So um, Adam, I wonder if you might be able to play the video, please. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in un If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. 
Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. Um, so ho hopefully, um, hopefully you can hear me there, but ho hopefully that gives you um, a bit of an indication around um, some of the way that we um, ha have tried to manage our um, our services and we've been or, or our implementation of this um, wounds care application. So um, I, I won't go through that that slide uh, again, but hopefully it gives you some of those um, ideas that uh, actually for us, whilst we knew we had our innovators, we wanted to find those followers and we knew that the people who were the followers and then who came on later on probably were not going to behave in exactly the same way as the innovator, but actually they did enough to be able to test out this wound care application and that's what we wanted that mass spread um, so Adam could you go to the next slide please so the, these are just my last few slides. So um, Anne's talked about this already. We worked very much from the model for improvement. We knew what we wanted to try to achieve. We've got some of those measures in place and then we wanted to test out um, the the, the the idea of the wound imagery and and do the PDSA cycles really learn and really discover uh, and work out how this um, particular particular application might work for us and, and what what we might get as a as a, re, as a result from it. Um, Adam, could you go to the next slide, please? And this was one of the key things, which was uh, this slide here, which was honestly, do go ahead, please give it a go. Please, as clinicians, don't 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 feel like you need to come back to us and ask us permission if you've got the permission to take the image that you want to take. Please give that a go. We would like you to test and try out this application so that we can learn alongside you as we're using this particular. Um, process as we move beyond our discovery phase um, and then the last one is just some of the principles that we've used uh, again to um to, to keep us sane um, as we go through it because it's not a straight journey and things don't always work as you want them to work and so these are just some of the principles that I've used with my colleagues to um to, to, to keep us going and uh, yeah hopefully now move to more standardized processes and in, embed this this particular way of working as as normal practice and that's us. 
Thank you, Lou. Wonderful video. And it absolutely captures that courage and of actually doing something different and going for it and just keeping the vision. So thank you. I think that was really, really interesting. One of the most difficult things about getting change. Right. Conscious of time. Ariel, we're not doing too badly. Time was only five minutes behind. So that's not the end of the world. And there's no pressure to catch up. We can always just squeeze questions at the end. But over to you, Ariel, to tell us what you're up to in Live Well. Thank you very much. Ariel, I think you might be on mute still. You just need the um, hover over your image and then the microphone at the bottom. I have done that. Is it working it's now? It's working. It's working. Ah. You're off. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So my name's Ariel. I'm one of the district nurse managers for Live Well Southwest. We're, we're based in the community in Plymouth. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about digitising wound care in the community um, and to tell you a bit about um, the challenges, but also, uh, most importantly, the successes that we have had. Can we go to the next slide? So just a very, very quick, we are live well in um, the community in Plymouth. We were formed in 2011 um, and basically we provide um, a service to a population of over 270,000 people. Um, next slide, please. So the main reason that we had for digitizing our wound care, um, we've had a, a, a few reasons that we can add into the um, that we can add into the mix. So the main thing was the GDPR around um, the patient's data in taking images. Unfortunately, we had um, concerns raised where staff had taken images with their personal mobile phones, and that wasn't out of malice or to try and cause. Um, um, cause concern, but actually because they wanted the best for their patients, for some reason their work mobile phone may not have been working and they just didn't know what to do. They didn't have eyes on the patient. So therefore, if they, if they couldn't show somebody, they felt like they weren't doing a good enough job. Um, we also had a family concern raised where an image was taken. It was on a work phone, um, but again, it's around that safety of the image capture and where that data is being stored. And if it's stored on a mobile phone, it's not as secure as, as staff may have felt it was. Um, and also we were concerned around consistency of measurements and descriptions of wounds. We'd had many investigations where the investigator would really struggle to really hit the nail on the head when they were trying to put together a timeline um, of when the wound deteriorated, when it got better. Um, and there was always always discrepancies in um, tissue tissue typing, mainly because that is such a subjective um, sub, such a subjective topic um, and analysis that, you know, two sets of eyes can see very different things. Um, also consistency of dressings and following wound care plans. Um, there was a concern around this and, and actually we felt that if we had some sort of digital solution that could support with this, we may find that we improve healing rates. Um, and really understanding what the impact um, is of the dressing regime, like what impact is that having on the patient? Is it actually improving things? Or are we or, or are we finding that the wound is deteriorating and not picking up on it quick enough? Um, and how long has the patient's wound been in existence? This is obviously uh, uh, this is sometimes a concern when we have people with lower limb ulcers. We really, really need to be making sure that we are as soon as we are finding we know the onset date of that wound, that we really make a concerted effort to, to follow the lower, li lower limb guidance and get that wound healed as quickly as possible. Um, next slide, please. So in the beginning, um, it could have finished before it even started. We, um, one of our community matrons had uh, identified a digital uh, wound care application um, that she was she had seen um, at a conference and brought that to our um, project development office and they said Do you know what let's give it a go so they contacted um, a company and basically they said yep yeah, let's let's do a trial and see see how we go with it now we did launch this in um, 
it was brought to the organization around January, February time um, in 2019. So just when COVID had, wait, 2020, sorry, when COVID had just hit. So all of the um, taught sessions would have been online for the staff. Um, they'd already been quite worn out by this process and by um, by doing Teams meetings and and doing things online. So by the time that COVID hit and they were very busy and under a lot of pressure, this felt like an added thing for them to learn. Um, they didn't initially have enough mobile phones that could support the app. So that was definitely something that was would have provided a hindrance to, to the workforce. Um, and the staff weren't very good at feeding back what the barriers were. It was easier to put the phone in the drawer and say, actually, we we haven't had time or we weren't able to use it. But actually, when I sat with staff um, and really unpicked what was going on, they were able to report to me things that were a concern that were actually really easily rectified. So this application was introduced to the, the staff. I was actually on maternity leave at the time. Um, and then I returned and was presented with this app and asked to go out. And for me as a manager, the the ultimate thing is that I go out and use it myself. If I want my staff to use it, I'm going to go and sit with them, see what the challenges are, what are the barriers and how we're going to overcome them together. So some of the things that they had reported was the process of adding the patient to the um, to the application took time when they were at the home and they felt like it was a bit of a barrier to communication because they were spending time inputting the data. But this was easily remedied because they were able to input that data before they left the office. We have a whitelisted process within System One where um, where consent is um, consent is automatically shared. Um, you know, following national guidance. Um, so if there is anybody who descends to information sharing, we know that already. So we can have that discussion over the telephone, or we can we can just not not use the imaging app if, if appropriate. But the, the gold standard would be that we use it for everybody with a wound so that we've got it from the outset. Um, and also they said that the process of using the app took too long. So when they saying that it took too long, actually it was around the process of the individual and how they were using it. So they'd had online education, but when they'd come to use the app themselves, they weren't familiar with navigating around that application. So it was good to sit with staff and have a really good hands-on um, discussion and, and look at what the app would provide us. And it had a really good um, flow and narrative where we could record cord dressing selection, um, duration of wound, size, or all, all of those things, um, and what dressings we were putting on the wound, care plan and notes. However, the it did provide an element of duplication because we were currently on, um, uh, we have a digital um, record system but the, the two at that time, they weren't um, integrated. So therefore, it meant that they felt like they were duplicating. Um, but we'll come on to how we very, very easily overcame all of these things. Um, and so, yeah, uh, online learning, for even for me, speaking with staff that I know very well, it is quite a challenge. Next slide, please. So our plan of action, once I'd identified what the app could do, how it could serve us well, worked really, really closely with the with the um, the solution developer, so the company that owned the application, um, and with our our PDO team. So our um, uh, yeah, so our project team. And um, basically, we identified clinical champions on the ground. So people who are really felt like they wanted to be a part of it, they identified themselves and people that were quite digitally innovative. Um, and really and truly being out with the staff and really understanding what the buy-in is. So what is the buy-in for me as a clinician? Well, there's many, many buy-ins. There's many, many benefits. And we had to just identify them as we went along and record them so that we had it as kind of a mini training session, if you like. Um, and we can talk about the buy-in in a minute um, and how we, how we achieve that. Um, then we had we made sure that we focused on it as a frontline rollout, so it wasn't top down approach. It was very much in the hands of the um, the staff and making sure that they were aware of the application, what um, the benefits of that application were, and and how they were going to be able to um, use it to their benefit. Um, and 
really using the app to un, using the app and demonstrating the process to the staff so that they they didn't find it um you know too challenging and actually putting together small videos and things um that they could use to um to understand how the app works the company that we work with at the moment um what well, now um they are are great and they have educational videos that we can send out to the staff so that was a quick win um and i personally made a very basic slide deck of some success stories that we pulled out from from patients um, and um, it was really important because that showed the timeline and it showed staff how important it is to capture those images and have them as a um, as a as a timeline pictorial um, uh, monitoring of the patient um, and I spent time understanding the drawbacks so spending time with clinicians and really understanding what we would need to to work with the with the um, the product developer um, on this uh, the graph at the top actually is the initial rollout so we'd started having talks at the start of the year and then I came back in June, July, and that's when we really started to accelerate our usage. So that was quite, um, it was quite a nice, nice graph to see. Next slide, please. So our plan of action continued with working with the solutions team, changing the application to benefit our organization. They're really proactive, really understanding and really um, supportive of what the district nursing needs were. Um, I say district nursing, the community needs because we it, this has been rolled out in um, uh, many, many services. All services who see wounds can use this application in our organization now. Um, we sourced um, different devices. We managed to tap into a pot of digital in innovation monies and we were able to use that to get devices that we could use the, um, the application on. Um, and we created a bit of competition. So the graph at the bottom I sent out to all of the staff and it sounds really, really silly I suppose but actually by sending out a graph every week it really inspired that um, that sense of competition um, and camaraderie between teams like we're going to win this month and although feels a little bit maybe a little bit childlike and silly actually it taps into that area of the psyche where people go do you know what we really want to win and we're going to see how and when we managed to get the amount of images increased we were ma able to get more data from more images and therefore we could develop the app to meet our needs um, and we just focused on the benefits and managing the challenges as quickly as possible next slide please so it was a cyclical kind of implementation implementation so understanding the needs of the service so the need of having digital imaging to support quality um, and quality of service and healing wounds much quicker was definitely one of those uh, one of the main priorities um, supporting teams to implement it on the front line and making sure that we had team champions so we identified four people within within each of our localities that they were going to champion and and drive things forward and we had an email trail where they were able to support that process um, and just really understanding the functionality of the solution and working closely with the the solutions team um, and yeah those weekly updates were a real morale boost next slide please so the actual potential measures of success, what we're hoping is that um, potentially we would like to see our Siri investigations reduced. And we know how much manpower um, an internal investigation can take. And this in turn would be a cost saving. What we're finding is that if we can take images when we raise our incident forms, the managers are able to see the image, see the wound series and feel a lot more reassured about the care plan that's in place, um, making sure that the, you know, the wound care plan meets the need of the patient and making sure that the healthcare assistants, when they're going out, they can take an image, um, they can send that image um, it, the images all go to the cloud, so it is really a, it's a really secure way of storing our images. But also, it means that a senior clinician can review the um, images from from an office, um, and they can give live information that live handover um, and describe what care plan they would like to follow, and then they can complete that care plan. Um, 
trying to reduce deterioration as soon as we notice deterioration the application that we use actually monitors the size we have a report that is generated every week that shows us wounds that stagnate or wounds that deteriorate and that's really important and it has really opened our eyes to the potential um, it also is able to um, monitor the um, tissue type of the wounds so if it's starting to develop a lot more slough or um, undetermined tissue types um, it it throws up a flag and says you need to review this wound and that is revolutionary in itself but also um, allowing the caseload holders to re review those patients more remotely so even though they've given that advice over the telephone they can still add they can still add um, uh, that advice to frontline workers and then when they go to review the patient that could be in a week's time rather than at the very next visit um, one of the frustrations with our healthcare assistants and I'm sure you can all relate with this is that they go and see a patient and because of work pressures sickness registered staff not being available they'll say that a patient needs a review but then at the next visit they may not have been able to do that so it just provides that support and makes everybody feel like they're you know, empowered to do um, the best job that they can do. Next slide, please. I'm nearly at the end. Um, also with the solution, we have a dashboard and it gives us amazing live data. It tells us all about the wounds. This is just an example. So basically we can draw as much data or as little as we want and we can monitor the, you know, the types of wounds that are coming through um, and see, you know, what, what other support patients might need. But also with the dashboard, we can pull out particular um, targets that we're trying to audit. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just an example of a photo image series. Hopefully you can see it well enough. But basically, um, I went to see this patient. So as I say, I really wanted people to understand that I was able to use this and, and um, use the solution myself. Um, and I went out on the 21st of July. It was a nasty skin tear. The gentleman had had a form. We know that these wounds can go one way or the other. And I put a care plan in place dress the wound and then I asked one of my colleagues who was unregistered to go and see the patient at the next visit a week later and the wound image reassured me that my care plan was correct and for me that was just that's just the gold standard that's exactly what we need because we have clinicians out there who aren't able to see all 100 you know patients on their caseload but actually that reassurance means that I have the right care plan in place and we continue as we are next slide Again, very quickly, a lady who was going into compression, uh, a shin wound, um, very quickly went into compression and we healed her quickly. But for, as someone who is a clinician who's able to view, view the patient remotely, I'm happy with the care that we're providing. And actually, I don't need to see that patient again myself because I'm reassured that we have the right care plan in place. And actually, within a four week period, we managed to heal that patient. Next slide. Um, so very quickly, what we found is that um, the we found that the um, we found we found that with the deter deterioration can be um, spotted um, easily. We can easily track the improvement or deterioration of wounds. It's improved the consistency of the dressings that are being being used, um, and it's facilitating patient education. Patients are really loving being able to see the wound that's on the bottom of their leg that they've never been able to see themselves. And having that image series means that they can track the the progression, and it allows them to buy into that care, um, the, the you know the care advice that we've given. And it has enhanced our care planning and improved our MDT working because we can share this with our colleagues, especially if we're suggesting there's an infection. We can pass um, we can pass reports to our colleagues for advice. Next slide. I think we're at the end. A little bit on st what staff say. You can read this when this goes out, but basically they were really singing its praises. And although it was a you know a new thing, something that we had to put a lot of time in. Actually, we did a we have done a um, a Wounds UK poster around how staff feel because it's about that quality that it provides to staff. Next slide. And the future, we just want to make sure that we're reducing series incidents, complaints, things like that. Um, continue to embed and empower staff, um, improve the oversight of the caseload holders, especially in the workforce that we we find ourselves in nationally, um, and, and allow us to review our workforce and the ability. So if we're unable to recruit to those posts, what does that look like and what will digital innovation provide for us in the future? Um, and real ease of data collection and improve our KPIs such as healing rates um, consistently through our care and review.
And I think that's it. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Danielle. Um, Ariel, we are we are right at the end of our I session. I know. I'm so. Don't sorry. worry. It's not criticism. It's <laughs> been fascinating. Actually, there's only one question I think which hasn't been answered, which was a query about home visits. But I'll speak. If it's all right with you, I'll speak on behalf of you because I know Livewell is one of our first tranche implementation sites, and certainly what we're hearing from other sites is it's difficult to quantify yet um, the impact on workforce because we don't yet have enough data but certainly it looks hugely encouraging is that a fair thing to say that it does it's, appear to be taking pressures off it's absolutely encouraging it, um yes we don't have the data we have that fluctuation currently within workforce um and within you know the the um meeting the patient's needs but because of workforce pressures. However, having the application personally, being able to give people live information, especially when I'm busy with back-to-back -back meetings for whatever, being able to give them that support in a virtual way has revolutionized the way that I can provide support to, to my staff. Yeah. And uh, I'm hoping that we can use digital innovation to really streamline a lot of our processes. And um, this is just a really, it, this has been a, a really big win for us. Yeah, I'm very conscious of time and I know Anne and I are also supposed to be somewhere else now. But just to wrap up, thank you all for your, for your excellent talks, to thank the sponsors for sponsoring the session. And just a final thing to end up and coincidentally yesterday I had a, I was speaking with my boss and he and I had gone down to London, oh, it's pre-COVID, so some years ago, and we'd looked at the early one of these and he was saying how he'd seen the the most recent version of what it could do and he could not believe the progress but what was lovely was the company had said but yes but we've made that progress because of our work with the national wound care strategy program and because of organizations like yours that basically we've listened and learned and improved our product and it absolutely i know Anne is always in my ear going use and improve use and improve and she's absolutely right because we won't get this improvement unless we embrace such products we use them and then we feedback well it's good but i wish it did this or i wish we could do that and that's exactly what's happening with these products it's because organization like yours are being brave getting out there using them and not just throwing them up because they're not perfect but saying yeah it's good but do you know what it'd be even better if it could do this so I think I would say this to everybody listening in, get engaged. This is the future. It's not a pipe dream. This is the future and it's the way forward. And thank you so much for your time and for dialing in today to our audience as well. And I hope it's been useful to you. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>